So just to recap a little bit about where we are, so we have Professor uh, Spackman going to give the talk on advanced methods for econ eval value for money. Um, his talk is going to go a little bit around incremental cost effectiveness ratios, but then he's going to provide some real tangible examples of how economics um, can be used for decision making and demonstrating value for money. But in terms of where we were in the program, you know, we had talked about costs, right? Then we moved into outcomes, now we have costs and outcomes. And then last week, Professor McCabe had talked about, well, what, how do you put that all together? Then he talked about modeling, right? How you bring in costs, probabilities, outcomes together in an economic framework to then um, produce the uh, cost effectiveness results. And so that leads in nicely, I think, to, to Eldon's talk on, um, on, on the value for money piece. So I'm not going to go over his bio as um, you have the package uh, with you. Just suffice to say, again, he's an uh, uh, internationally recognized uh, health economist as well. And we're very happy that he's in Alberta at UFC and very happy that he could make the flight out to just give an hour talk and then fly back to Calgary. So he basically we saw essentially a whole working day to be here. So thank you very much, Eldon. So please welcome me in uh, uh, introducing Eldon Spackman. There you go. Thank you. I'm um, very pleased to be here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about real world value for money. Um, the objective that I was given was to think about a current organization. If you're already doing all of these things, how do you know if you're getting value for money? How do you know if you're doing the right things? And so um, before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about what my perspective of health economics is, what we bring to those decisions about value to money, what, that, what value to money means to me. Um, and just to say that when, I, when we talk about economics, we're thinking about scarcity, that we can't have everything that we want. Um, and in the current climate, that's pretty clear. Uh, oil's not booming, we're not getting everything we want. There's this pressure to, to uh, save money, to, to do less. And that's possible, and to still have value for money, to do less and have value for money. And, and the reason why that's possible is because what we're trying to do is maximize a given budget. So whatever that budget is, we're going to do the best thing that we can do with that budget. And we think about it from a societal perspective. So we're not thinking about one individual getting everything. We're thinking about everybody in society benefiting to the best of our ability. And the way that we think about health and maximizing health is in two kind of pieces, quality of life, which you've talked about, I think, and then length of life. So these are the two, two ways that we think about health in health economics. And the one thing that it, health economics or cost effectiveness analysis in, in this situation is not about is not about determining the size of the budget. That is a separate question where we're trading off education versus health versus transportation versus everything else that we can do with public funds. That's a separate question. Right here we're saying we have a health budget. What's the best thing that we can do with that health budget? And it's not necessarily about saving money. We're not trying to, in this scenario, we're not trying to lower the health budget. The health budget is what the health budget is. It might be lower than it was last year, but we're just trying to do the best with that health budget. We're not trying to, to bring it down somehow. And just to say that health economists are not all greedy technocrats trying to save money. Our main focus is to have health, is to maximize health. So this is all about health. Have you seen the cost effectiveness plane? Did Chris or someone else show you that? I see some nods, so I'll go through this quickly. When we make comparisons of value for money, it's compared to what we would have done otherwise. If you have a new treatment, it's compared to what that old treatment was. And so we look at the incremental benefit and we look at the incremental cost. So what's the additional cost? What's the additional benefit? And we look at it on this cost effectiveness plane. If we're in the left top quadrant where it's less effective and more costly, that's an easy decision. If your new treatment is in this quadrant, it's, you don't want to do it, right? If it's down in this 
bottom right quadrant, it's an easy decision. You prefer the new treatment. It's less costly, more effective. Easy decision. It's in these two other quadrants that the decision becomes more difficult. It's not an obvious decision. If it's more costly and more effective in the upper right, or if it's less costly and less effective in the lower left. And we often ignore this lower left quadrant, less costly, less effective, but it's actually the exact same decision just in reverse here, right? And so we, sh we need to pay attention to this lower quadrant as well. And if we're going to ignore everything in this lower quadrant, we're not going to get value for money. We need to take into account the whole quadrant and be willing to accept doing things that are less effective because they're less costly. And, uh, and we'll explain why that is in a second here. So if we think about a system that has a constrained health budget, this is our system. And we have a new technology that's coming into the system. It has health gains and it has some health cost. If we have a fixed budget, that means something has to come out of the system. Something's going in, something has to come out. And we think of this as our displaced service. When a technology or some treatment or service comes out of the system, we have costs that are available for that new technology. But there's also a patient group who just lost some health benefit because their service, their technology or treatment just exited the system. Now, we might think of it as the waiting line increased. So instead of uh, getting one day treatment, their one day treatment option exited the system and now they have a six month treatment option. And so they've lost six months worth of treatment or they've had to wait for six months. So they've been made worse off that patient group because someone else was made better off. And this is the thing that health economics brings to the table is to think about the societal perspective, to think about all the unnamed faceless patients who aren't standing in front of the doctor, who are gonna be affected by the decision the doctor makes with the patient standing right in front of them. And we're so focused on the one that we can see, that new treatment that often we forget about everybody else who will be affected, but we don't exactly know who they are and so it's really easy to forget about them. And so that's what health economics brings to the table, is to start thinking about the faceless uh, patients who are going to be affected by the decision. And to say they have value and we need to consider the value for money of the new technology and the value for money of, of what we're losing as well. And we only want to make the decision to accept this new technology if what it's pushing out doesn't provide as much health. So this is an easy decision if we say this new technology is very, very beneficial and cheap and what we're losing is not quite as beneficial. So we can make the system better by investing in this new treatment. Did they talk about thresholds with you? Have you heard the word threshold? Yes? Okay, good. Did they talk about it in this room so everyone should know, or is it only four people who know what a threshold is? <laughs> um, we make decisions at a $50,000 threshold, generally speaking. It's a completely made up number. There's no real reason to use it. But what this number means is that for every quality, for every $50,000 that we spend in our system, we're going to produce one quality adjusted life year. So that's kind of the efficiency of our current system. And every time we stop spending $50,000 on our current system and spend it on our new system, on a new treatment, we're pushing out one quality. We're not producing one quality. And so this is what our threshold tells us, is what we're going to lose. We're going to lose one quality for every $50,000 we spend on our new technology. So what we want to do is then have a new technology that produces a quality for less than $50,000. So that's why we're, when we compare our ICERs to thresholds, we're looking for something lower than the threshold. What it says is our new technology will produce health more cheaply than what was currently being produced. And that is our 
reason that we can say this is a good decision, we're going to go ahead with it. But you have to believe that $50,000 threshold or that you have a reasonable threshold to be able to say that we're making decisions that are make, using cost effectiveness analysis that are making our system better off. And so if this $50,000 doesn't, um, isn't what the opportunity cost is, that's what we call it of what's being displaced, the opportunity cost. If this doesn't represent our opportunity cost, then this, we don't know if we're doing the right thing. Maybe our opportunity cost is actually $30,000, and so when we invested in the $45,000 per quality technology, we actually made our system worse off. So this is a really important question if we're going to use cost-effectiveness analysis and get value for money. So this is the way I like to think about the cost-effectiveness plane. Because we said we're talking about money, but we don't care about money. Money just represents someone else's health. And so if we think about more costly, we're thinking about displacing someone else's health. When something's more costly, it displaces someone else's health. So if we spend more money in this area, it's less of someone else's health. So this, we can think about this cost effectiveness plane on the person in front of you's health compared to someone else's health. And, and that's what we mean here. So it's easy to make the decision. You prefer the old treatment if the new treatment has less of someone else's health and less of the patient's health. It's easy to make the decision if it has more of patient's health and more of someone else's health. And it's still difficult to make the decision when we have to trade off between someone else's health and uh, the patient in front of us health. And that's where that threshold comes in. And if we believe that we can produce someone else's health at $50,000 per quality, then anything that falls below that threshold is worth investing in. And that's how we know if it's valuable, if a new treatment is good value for money. I want to have a slight warning as we think about evaluating cost effectiveness analysis of a current system. So we might think if we're doing a new cost effectiveness analysis, we can criticize the person who did that old cost effectiveness analysis. Five years ago, they decided to implement MRIs for detecting prostate cancer, something like that. And now we're going to reevaluate it. And we find a different answer. And, and it's tempting to say they made the wrong decision five years ago. But that's not, that's not what we're here about. We, it's very difficult to say five years ago, giving the, the um, information that they had. Because now we have new information. We have updated patient costs. We know how it actually fits into the system. So what we're not trying to do here is trying to use new data and new context to criticize a previous decision. We're trying to update that decision and make a decision given the current amount of information. When we're thinking about a current system and understanding the value for money in a current system, we also might be using different data sources. When we make that original decision, we have uh, phase three data, very specific groups, costs are, we're not really sure how it's going to change the practice patterns of physicians. We've made assumptions. We're not totally sure here. Now we have data. We see it in the current system. We see how it changes the practice patterns. We see how it changes the costs. But now all we have is observational data, maybe. And so we need to think about the new types of data that we're using, um, the new context that it's in, and, and the different types of information that we can get. So the principles that Chris taught you last week are the same kinds of principles, but we just might have different data and different concerns about that data. So that was just set up for what I want to talk about today. And I want to talk about three kind of <laughs> ways of getting value for money out of a current system. I'm going to talk a little bit about value of implementation. I want to talk about cost effectiveness analysis in the context of something that's already ongoing. And then I, I want to share a new idea um, that's been done a little bit in the UK and, and that we've put in some grants for and are thinking about. And, and you can tell me if it's dumb or not. Um, first of all, one way to make your system better off is to do more of the things that you know are valuable. 
there are lots of things that are good in a system that are already happening. And you can make that system better off by doing more of them. When we think about a treatment and we think about its ICER and we think about the threshold. So let's say we have a threshold of $50,000. And this new treatment produces one quality for $50,000. It's just as good as the old treatment. There's actually no benefit to bringing that treatment in. We're completely indifferent between the new treatment and whatever it was going to displace. But generally, we bring in the new treatment because of a lot of reasons, <laughs> because it's new and exciting, and there's a lot of people who want it. But this treatment isn't necessarily something you're going to be really pushing and spend additional money on implementing, are you? Because as soon as you spend one more dollar to implement this, then it's not cost effective. It's not valuable. Treatment two here has an ICER of 20,000. And so you get this benefit. Every time you implement that, you get this $30,000 uh, net monetary benefit. And so this one, you would be willing to spend money to implement this treatment. And even further, if you had a treatment that was only $10,000 uh, per quality, if that was the ICER that had been determined through your cost effectiveness analysis, through your modeling, this one you would want to even implement more. So if there are things that are not happening that are very valuable, we can identify those things. And we've, and this is kind of the theory behind it. It's called expected value of information. If you have um, a current, this is your whole population. The black dots are the patients in the population who are receiving the treatment and getting all of that benefit. The white dots are those who are not getting the benefit. If you can get all of those people to get the benefit, then you have this, more, this much more value in your population. And you can use cost effectiveness analysis to figure out what the benefit of implementing something in your population is. Now, one slight wrinkle is that, well, we're, this is your initial population, those getting it, those not getting it. The problem is, is we can't really get 100% of people to do it. So we're only going to improve it by this much. Well, and then the other thing is, is it usually costs something to implement it. So we're going to take some of that value out because we've implemented it. So in the end, we actually end up with less value, but still something positive. And as long as this is positive, this is something we want to move forward to. So just to say that there's analyses that we can do using cost effectiveness analysis to determine whether something should be implemented more and how much more we should spend to implement something. And it depends on the value of the treatment, as we saw. If it's very cost effective, $10,000 per quality, uh, that's much better treatment to implement. It depends on the scope for improving the treatment's uptake. If 95% of people are already taking it, there's not that much value left over for you to get. Or if it's a very small population of people, if it's a treatment that's only used by 1,000 people in the province, then and you know 800 of them are already using it, 200 people uh, will not give you as much value. And the effectiveness and cost of strategies for improving uptake. So it depends whether you can identify those 200 people that aren't taking it and knock on their door and make sure they take it, or if you're going to the doctors and saying, this is the treatment we want everyone to do, and trying to educate doctors. So there's lots of different uptake um, options that we have. And each of those has its costs and its effectiveness as well that we need to take into account when we're trying to determine whether we want something implemented more. So we did this um, last year. It's been submitted to Heart Journal. Um, we looked at ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone antagonists, and combinations of all these treatments for people with chronic heart failure. Um, we knew what the cost effectiveness was from previous models. And we knew how many patients in the population got those treatments last year. And we knew what their contraindications were. So you can see on the top line, this is um, someone who had no contraindications. And 
the, they were provided everything. So there's almost 6,000 people who had no contraindications who were provided everything. In this, in the second row here, we have all the patients who were only provided uh, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. And they were for 865 people who had um, aldosterone <coughs> contraindications, and some of them had, and some of them had no, indica uh, no contraindications. So these patients, these 4,825, they had no contraindications, and they were only receiving beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So they could potentially be better off by getting aldosterone as well. So these, the, the difference, these 4,000 patients are some of the patients that could benefit in our model. And then we can go through and see, um, you know, in this case, they're only getting beta blockers and aldosterone antagonists, and there's 507 who could also be getting ACE inhibitors. And from our analysis, we know that ACE inhibitors are cost effective, that they're going to be good for these patients. So then we can go through and determine um, what the benefit for each of those patients would be. This is too comp this is not worth explaining, sorry. Um, and we can, uh, sorry. So we can look at what the benefit will be. I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. Um, so we'll look at the year 2013. The red patients are those who could benefit from ACE in, if ACE inhibitors were provided. The blue ones are the number of patients who could benefit if uh, beta blockers were, um, were provided. And the green is the number of patients who could benefit if both were provided. The reason the green one is lower than the red and blue one together is because there's overlap between those red and blue patients, right? Some of those patients are not getting either beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, and so they would benefit from both of them. So what we can do is we can do a, a very easy analysis to say, these are the types of patients who would benefit um, and identify how many are not, are not currently benefiting. And then we can look at what are our options for improving the implementation. So in, in a systematic review, we looked at different ways to improve it. Printed educational material would only improve uptake by 2%. Audits and feedbacks, 3%. Local opinion leaders, 9%. Reminder systems, 11%. And there were no costs available for doing these things. So we had to make some assumptions about it um, and try to figure out what the cost of each of them would be. And so what we can see here is the amount of money that we expect to have to be, um, that would have to be spent and the absolute increase of each of those, of those things. And so here we can say, uh, at what cost would each of these things be beneficial? Because here's our cost effectiveness threshold. And so we say uh, an ab an absolute increase of 6% from continuous education meetings and workshop would be cost effective up to 8 million pounds. So we can say how much, up to what amount you'd be willing to spend on continuous education meetings and workshops to be able to implement this new strategy. So um, this is a, a new way to think about value of information. These aren't being done very frequently. They're done from information that's already available in the system. Usually we use a cost effectiveness analysis and that information that's already been done. Uh, generally systems know where uptake is good and where it is not good. And so we can use all of that information to, um, to come up with a strategy for improving implementation on things that we know are good for f value for money and therefore improve value for money in our system. The second thing I want to talk about is um, cost effectiveness analyses in general. And we've currently done uh, an analysis for B BC Ministry of Health. They were interested in transcutaneous bilirubinometers. So this is measuring jaundice in newborns. Um, and it avoids uh, uh, very significantly uh, it's deadly, it has terrible comorbidities, cornicteris, but it affects one in 50,000 babies. And so the question is, should we be screening with this new device if we're going to have the potential of saving one in 50,000 babies? What are the 
uh, uh, alternatives of doing this? How much does this cost? How much would it take to, to implement this in our system? So these are the types of questions. Some of uh, BC is already using these devices. So we had some data on what was already happening and how they were being used. And um, they wanted to know about what's the current effectiveness and safety of these devices. Um, they wanted to know about the capacity for benefit, how it would change patterns of care, um, current experience with these devices, and then the budget impact. So these were the questions that we were trying to answer. And we did it using literature reviews, going through all the current data, cost effectiveness analyses. Um, we did a, a new model to look at this. Um, we did a budget impact analysis. We looked at each of the hospitals, how many babies are born at the, those hospitals, how many new devices each of the hospitals would need. Um, we looked at you know, nur additional nursing time. Would you need to hire new nurses to do this? Should it only be used in the hospital? Should you be using it in the community to follow up um, like we do in, in other places? So Calgary has this comprehensive system where they follow up with every baby or they try to and they send public health nurses to homes to follow up with these devices. And, and so this is something that's ongoing. And BC wants to know, should we be increasing it? Should we be decreasing it? Should we be funding this? How do we improve value of our current system? And we do this using a lot of the same methods that Chris talked about last week if we were making decisions about a new treatment entering. This is something that's been around for a long time, but we can still evaluate it. And we have some data on it as well. We know how many babies get connectorous in BC. We know how many babies get jaundice. So we, we have this type of information that we can use to make this decision. The other type of analysis you might think about, even in an ongoing system, is some kind of randomized trial. There's still opportunities to collect data. And you might do a more pragmatic trial. Um, instead of going after efficacy, you might try for effectiveness and, and allow patients not to narrow it down to this tiny group of patients who you know the treatment is going to work in because they have no other comorbidities. You might look at the patient population that's actually using the treatment. So you might do something more pragmatic. And so uh, last year we did this trial for patients with moderate to severe depression. We looked at three treatments, they were randomized to acupuncture, counseling, or current care. And we found, so we have these three arms, we found that um, acupuncture had the best outcomes in the depression measures, um, followed by counseling and then usual care. There was a lot of overlap in, in, the, um, in the results, but um, acupuncture was actually statistically significantly better in, in a pragmatic trial. Um, and so we did a cost effectiveness analysis to say, what are the costs? What are the additional costs of this? Is this valuable um, for the UK to pay for acupuncture in, in the community? And we looked at the EQ5D. So that's our measure of health-related quality of life. And we take into account the length of life in a depression trial. Uh, over one year, there was no difference in mortality. So we're just looking at the benefits of quality of life in these patients. And you see that uh, there's a lot of overlap again, but acupuncture is better until the very end when it's about the same. So we can look at these <coughs> treatments and look at the costs and uh, figure out you know, the cost of the GP, practice nurses, all the different costs that are going to change if we implement acupuncture in the community, if we continue doing counseling or increase counseling, or if we just do our usual care. And we uh, can figure out the total costs, and we can figure out the depression-related costs, and look at the benefits, combine them with the costs, and then make a decision based on the ICER. And what we see here is that uh, the ICER of acupuncture um, compared to usual care was 4,000 pounds. So uh, we generally make decisions at 
20 to 30,000 pounds in the UK. So this was determined to be cost effective and counseling was a higher icer above our threshold. So um, acupuncture was de determined to be the cost effective option. So all that just to say that even though these things were ongoing in the community, we can still to some extent do a trial, we can randomize the trial, we can collect the data on uh, quality of life and cost and put them together to make a value uh, decision. Now we won't always be able to randomize for different reasons um, and we might have to use observational data, but we can do that as well. And we can use that observational data to update models that we already have to improve the inputs into models that are already there or we can do something like this pragmatic trial except with observational data where we're looking at the benefits and compare them directly to costs. So there's lots of options uh, of things that we can do. But one of the issues that we have here is that that was just one treatment, right? If we know, if we have a question about one treatment then we can answer that question. And cost effectiveness analysis is really good at looking at one thing compared to the other things that you could do. But when we're thinking about our whole system, where do you start? There are, every treatment needs to be evaluated. Everything could be compared. Um, so there's just too many treatments to, to do a trial on everything that we do in a system. And there's lots of variation in treatment in different locations. In, Calgary versus Edmonton versus rural versus everywhere else in Canada, there's different ways that people practice and not always the right data to collect. So we want to make these decisions based on length of life and quality of life and we're really good at getting length of life information. We generally know when people die. Um, quality of life information is a little bit more difficult. And then we have to believe in our ICER. We have to believe in the threshold. We have to be willing to accept a less effective treatment if that's going to make society better off. And I don't think we're there yet. I don't think that physicians are willing to say, I, there's something better, but I'm going to give you this less effective treatment because it'll make society better off. I, I don't think that's how we think about things. And then just change in general it's very, very difficult to make some of the changes that we need to have something be, to have our system be valuable, partly because of the arguments I already used, partly because of strong interests from different types of group. And, and these uh, current practices get very entrenched into a system. And there's, very, there's a lot of incentives for people to keep things the way that they are. And so if we're going to make our system more valuable, we have to be willing to um, make decisions based on societal perspective, we have to be willing to change and we have to be willing to say to people who have very strong opinions, um, we're looking at a bigger picture here than rather than just your one decision that you're making. Um, so how do we, how could we go about um, identifying those treatments that that might need to be reassessed. So one way to think about it is let's just look at the most expensive treatments. Let's reassess the most expensive treatments. And that's important. Uh, that's not the only part of the equation though, right? Uh, we're also interested in things that aren't as effective. So we might want to say, well, we want to limit it to things that we know are ineffective that aren't, aren't be done right. But, you know, if if they're just ineffective, maybe they're really, really cheap. And so it's actually worth doing them. They're not as effective as something else, but they're so cheap, it's worth doing those first. We might want to say, well, high budget impact, which combines not just the fact that it's an expensive treatment, but that it has a high prevalence as well. And because you can think of, you know, this very, very expensive treatment that treats one patient every 10 years. And is that the thing you actually want to focus on? Maybe not. Maybe we want to think about something that has a high budget impact. Um, or something that has less expensive, effective alternatives. So if we know that there's other things out there, we're not focusing on the treatment itself, we're focusing on all the other alternatives. Maybe that, that'll help us narrow down to what we want to reassess. 
what we actually want to do is kind of do all of these things. And that's what cost effectiveness analysis does, right? Is it looks at the cost, it looks at the effect, and it compares it to all the other alternatives. The one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't take prevalence into account, but we can do that as well. So let's say cost effectiveness analysis plus prevalence to help us figure this out. So how would we identify those things that have that aren't as cost effective, that are less valuable? Well, what we want to know first is the cost. We want to know the long-term outcomes. We said we're interested in um, quality of life and length of life. And then we need to say, well, at what level? Are, are we going to start by trying to search out every single treatment? Or could we do it at a bigger one, a, a diagnosis? and figure out what diagnosis areas are being treated less effectively, less cost effectively, um, or maybe a bigger disease, what disease buckets are not being treated, and then narrow it down. So we could do this at different levels. And, and this has been done before. So uh, Martin et al., um, they had this objective to ass assess the extent to which additional healthcare expenditure yields patient benefit in the form of improved health outcomes. So they looked at the UK system, and they looked at these different program budgets. So they have 23 programs, and they're cancer and respiratory and circulatory, and they have these budgets. And then they wanted to say, what are, what's each of those budgets buying us? So what are we getting out of that cancer budget? We know how much we're spending. Well, we know how many people are dying of cancer every year, and we can relate the number of people, the amount we're spending, and the number of people that are dying and try to figure out if, if this is valuable, if what we're doing is valuable compared to what we're doing in respiratory. Um, and they found that across these 23, they could look at how much is being spent um, in each of these buckets. So they found the lar that the largest spend was $163 per patient for mental health. Um, that primary care was 140 uh, pounds per patient, circulatory was 121, and cancer was 80 pounds. Um, and, and then what you might say, well, these, there's a lot of variation across the country on these costs. And uh, for instance, in, in cancer, there was, it depended on where you lived, but you might get 43 pounds per head per cancer patient or 151 per, per head. And actually, I don't think these are cancer patients. I think these are the population. That's why they're so low. Um, but uh, there's different needs in each of these populations. So you want to take into account the needs of the patient, the comorbidities, the other things that might be affecting it that we're not going to be able to control with health. So we want to control for needs. And what they found is that uh, the cost per saving an additional life year in cancer was uh, 15,000 pounds in the most recent year that they had, and that the 95% confidence interval was 9,000 pounds to about 38,000 pounds. So that's big uncertainty around their analysis. But even with uncertainty, we know that we want to make decisions at our expectation, right? And we can worry about trying to figure out the uncertainty by getting more information. But we want to make that decision of what our expectation is. And then we see that th they reported um, some other diseases as well. And you can see they're not that different from each other. Um, but it costs 10000 extra dollars to save a life in diabetes, one year of life in diabetes compared to cancer. So what this says is cancer is not as inefficient as we might think in this case, that diabetes might be more inefficient. And then what they point out is, well, this is just life you're safe. This is only mortality. And the goal of diabetes isn't only mortality. One of the main goals of cancer is improving mortality. So you would expect it to do well on the mortality. Uh, diabetes, though, can improve your quality of life quite a bit. And this analysis didn't take into account quality of life. So we did an updated analysis. Uh, this was published in 2015. Um, and we tried to take into account the quality of life of each of these diseases as well. And we report the cost per quality for 23 
we actually report it for 21 different uh, program budgets. We didn't report um, general practice because it's we didn't expect, we kind of attributed all the benefits of general practice across all the other disease areas. So that budget um, we don't have here. But here are a few that we did that uh, I've pulled out to look at. Uh, cancer was pretty similar to what they found. This is cost per quality though. So this is a quality adjusted life year instead of just uh, life year saved. This does take into account quality of life. And it does go up a little bit probably because cancer doesn't have the best outcomes on quality of life, right? But you can see that respiratory is very efficient or much more efficient than some of the others and that maternity and neonate, uh, it costs almost three million pounds for one additional qual quality. And that's taking into account the whole length of their life the fact that you could benefit the baby. So this is taking into account everything you're thinking you probably haven't taken into account. This is, you know, we've done the best that we can with the data. Yes, there's some holes that can be poked in, but this is our best estimate. So what it says to me is we might be spending too much on maternity and neonates. And where are the areas that we could go in and dive in, say, what are we doing? Uh, what could we do better? How could we make it more efficient? And maybe what we want to be doing is spending more on respiratory. So this just gives us a kind of an outline, some general, maybe we need to look into these disease areas a little bit more closely. And so our new idea is to, to do this in Alberta, to link healthcare spending and outcomes together. We've put in some grants just in cancer to look at cancer specifically. Um, the first step is to, to use uh, data that's available in Alberta to look at the costs of treating cancer patients, look at those costs over time, how those change over time. The second phase is to do a predictive model of their life expectancy, so to come up with that mortality piece of our equation. The third step is to do a predictive model of their health-related quality of life, and we can get some of that information from Canadian Community Health Services uh, survey or health survey um, and so we can come up with models to kind of predict quality of life in patients with cancer and then we can link all of that information together because those are the three things that we're interested in right cost quality of life and mortality and to say how much are we spending in cancer how efficiently are we providing cancer treatment in Alberta so this test this uh, grant is just kind of the first step to make sure that we can do it. And, and the information here um, can be used for a number of different things. We could do other disease areas and we could compare cancer to other disease areas. We can compare cancer spending over time and are we getting more efficient in our cancer spending. The other thing that this gives us is our opportunity cost, right? So we know what, how efficient our current system is. So going back to what we were talking about with the threshold, if we come up with uh, that in the current system we can produce um, a quality for $45,000, then we know we've been making a mistake between the $45,000 and whatever our thresh made up threshold is right now. So this kind of gives us, directs us towards a threshold to help us improve those decisions. And then the other thing it can say is, uh, compared to other countries, are we, are we being efficient with our cancer spending? And if not, uh, what can we do better? If so, um, great, we don't need to do anything maybe. But this will just point us using data that we already have towards um, trying to make the system a little bit more efficient. So, one of the, the big things I want you to take away from this is that if you're going to make a decision using cost effectiveness analysis, you need to have a threshold. And you need to understand the opportunity cost. You need to believe that there's an opportunity cost. If you don't believe there's an opportunity cost, do not do a cost effectiveness analysis. There's no reason to. Only do this if you believe that by uh, investing in a new treatment, you're going to affect everybody else. If you don't believe that, we don't need to do cost effectiveness analysis. There's the second point is I want you to take away is that 
it's not all about getting new treatments. Some of it's just about doing better what we already know is good. And so we can think about implementing things that are already good in the system. Third one is cost effectiveness analysis works at all points throughout a technology cycle. We often think about it as an argument to put something new into the system. It doesn't only be, need to be done there. We can do it throughout its life cycle. And the year afterwards, we could say, is it still cost effective? We don't want to <laughs> probably use our resources like that, that we're looking at it so frequently. But at any point where there's a question about its cost effectiveness, we can update that model that we use to to first invest in it with the current data and to make a new judgment about whether something is still cost effective. And then the final point is that there's an opportunity to identify diseases that might not be providing value for money and to be able to compare across these diseases. And you might say, I'm totally happy with neonates in maternity getting three, three million pounds per quality. That is, a, completely legitimate moral argument. But you just have to accept that you could be doing better by investing in any of those other disease areas. And that there's a trade-off when you invest that much into maternity and neonates. Not that that's a wrong decision that we're making, but it allows us to make judgments about the decisions that we are making. It's a very uncomfortable judgment to make often. Uh, and it's easier just to wave our hands and pretend these decisions aren't being made or not look too closely at the decisions. But we can't make the system better if we're not willing to use the information that's there and the information that we have um, to try to make the system more efficient. So, thank you. Mm -hmm.